And we and we do, and we do, and we do. I uh, uh, briefly want to say uh, welcome back to Steve after being gone to Colorado uh, and training. And I said, uh, uh, how was it? And he said, we need to sit down and talk. And uh, I said, well, at least you're still talking to me. So uh, that's a good thing. I mean, he may be a little bit overwhelmed, but they got snow and we want to uh, thank God for his safe return and his commitment to that in group work camp. Uh, and we also uh, have with us worshiping uh, with us this morning the soon-to-be Reverend Packman, uh, back from his his uh, service um, and uh, went straight to seminary, I believe. Um, so we uh, want to welcome him uh, this morning as well. Uh, today we continue uh, with our Masquerade sermon series as we continue looking at internal masks. Uh, that all of us wear. And if you've been following with us, and if you've been here, you'll remember that, that we said that all masks, all eternal masks that we wear, people that put on around us, are worn for three purposes. One is it's to hide something, to, to cover up something that we don't want others to see. Second, we wear these masks to distance ourselves from other people. It makes us unapproachable. It, it puts distance between them and us. And third, we wear these masks to make us look like something we're not. And today we're going to look at the mask of greed. And if you're like me, when we, we think about greed as it's in the news uh, constantly now with the Occupy Wall Street, if you're like me, when we think about greed, we think about the stereotypical rich guy. People are protesting on Wall Street because of their perception of, of what greed is. And, and when I think of greed, if you're like me, I think of Ebenezer Scrooge. And I'm going to show my age, but I think of Scrooge McDuck. Remember Scrooge McDuck and the cartoons? Or Bernie Madoff. You know, these, these fat cats, you know, that, that have all this stuff. But in re reality, just like the protesters, we really don't know if these people are generous or not. We have no idea of their generosity. But today we're not going to look at the stereotypical greed because greed is not an outward thing as much as it is an inward mindset. For every mask we wear, if you've been following with us on, on here every Sunday morning or, or on the internet, you'll know that, that we wear these masks. And behind each of these masks is a motivating mindset that goes with them. We wear these masks because they feel comfortable to us. There's, there's a motivating mindset behind each one. And if, if you remember, the motivating mindset behind the mask of worry was, was a lack of trust. And the motivating, motivating mindset behind the mask of pride is, is a lack of adequacy or thinking we're not good enough or thinking that closing our minds off to not being teachable to relearn something that we think we already know. And the motivating, motivating mindset of greed is a scarcity, I can't speak this morning, mindset. It's an internal feeling that there's never enough. Scarcity mindset is a, a feeling or a set of actions that exhibit that there is never enough. It's walking through life with clenched fist. It's the salesperson that breaks all the sales records and doesn't share his ideas and his, his tricks of the trade to the young guy that just started. A scarcity mindset is a couple that, that finds the greatest vacation spot but will not tell anyone because they... Because when they go there, they want to run, they don't want to run into any of their friends. And if they tell one person, they'll tell someone else, they'll tell someone else, and then the next time they go to that vacation spot, it ruins their tranquility because they see all their friends there. And financially, you can, you can see it clearly in those like my, my grandmother and my, and my father who were lived or were raised during the Great Depression. Everyone in that generation holds tightly to everything they have because they lived in a time when the attitude was what's mine is mine and I have to hold on to it as tight as I can because there is a scarcity. There's not enough to go around. That's what a scarcity mindset is. But here's the problem. 
problem. The, the, the problem is God does not want us to live with a scarcity mindset, but instead wants us to develop and live with an abundance mindset. Abundance mindset sets us free from the scarcity mindset. And you see, it's important because a scarcity mindset does two things. First, it makes us walk around life with, with clenched fists. And that which, when we do that, it absolutely shuts off our ability to receive anything. If, if you're walking around with your hands like this, and I hand you something, you can't take it. And it also, a scarcity mindset makes us completely focused on ourselves. A scarcity mindset makes us focus only on our own needs, our own wants, and our own money. And this is not, it is not a mindset or posture in life that God can bless. And today we're going to look at four principles of living a life and living with an abundance mindset. And I, I, I want to say, before we get started, there's a huge risk. There's a huge risk that many of you may misunderstood, misunderstand exactly what I was speaking about this morning. There's a huge risk that many of you will question my motives. But these principles that we're going to go through this morning are principles that Kelly and I have learned as a young couple. It's, it's principles that we strive to live by in our life. And I would not be a good leader, I would not be a good pastor... If I did not take the time this morning and take that risk to share those with you. The first principle, you might, you might want to jot these down. The first principle of an abundant mindset is that abundance, abundant mindset begins in the heart. If I asked you this morning who is generous, all of us would raise our hands. Who doesn't want to be viewed as generous? In our moral compass, we all at some level view ourselves as generous. But we must look at generosity at the heart level. And this morning it's a litmus test. And if you will, turn with me to Proverbs, 28, Proverbs 3, 28 through 27. And this is a litmus test of generosity. And let's, let's see how we do this morning. It says, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due. When it is in your power to do it. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come again tomorrow and I will give it. When you have it with you. Simply put, when you see a need, whether that's a need of time, money, resources or whatever. whatever if you see a need and you have the ability to do something about it, do you do it? And Simon would say, if you do, then you are generous. Simply put, if you see a need and you do something about that need, you are generous. But there's a clinch in here. Did you catch it? It says we have to do it now. We have to do it right there, then on the spot. Because Solomon knows that if you don't act now, you're not going to do it. Oh, I'll, I'll give it to you tomorrow, or I'll, I'll spend time with you tomorrow, or I'll do it tomorrow. Tomorrow becomes into tomorrow, and then days and weeks and months and years, and then you forgot all about it. He knows that. And it says, if it's in your power to act, act now. An abundance mindset, a generous heart, says if you see a need, and you act now, and, do, and you act now and do something about it. And if we look real quick in, in the New Testament of James, Chapter 4, 17, it says, Anyone then who knows the right thing to do and fails to do it commits sin. James right here says that if you see a need and you don't do it, it's on the level of sin. If we see a need, have the power to do something about that need, and do nothing, we have sinned. So what about us? Are we generous on a heart level? The second, second principle of this abundant mindset believes that God and God alone is our source. If we live our life believing that God and God alone is our source, do we do that? And again, if, you, if you're still there, join me up on the screen. Uh, 1 James 17. 
It says, every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. It tells us that if any good, any perfect gift has come into our lives under no certain terms, we need to recognize that it comes from God. It comes from our Heavenly Father. And when we do this, we're putting our trust into a power that does not change like shifting, sh shifting shadows. Have you ever watched a shadow as the sun moves, the shadow moves? And here's a newsflash from Captain Obvious. The stock exchange is not our source. Wall Street is not our source. New York Stock Exchange is not our source. The real estate market is not our source. These are things that are shifting like the shadows. If you've had any money in the last five years that's been invested in 501k, it hasn't stayed the same. It's been moving up and down. And we live in a world, which I've said time and time again, we live in a world which is not spiritually neutral, which tells us to put our attention, put our efforts, put our energy, and put our money in things besides God that are not our source. So who is our source in our life? Our job is not our source. No, no matter how long you've worked for a place, no matter how strong you think the industry that you are working in, no matter how secure you think you are in employment, it's not our source. And, and stay with me here this morning because I'm trying to lay down a foundation for our life and for our church. Our abundant mindset understands in no uncertain terms that God and God alone is our source. Not our spouse, not the government, not our 501k, not our inheritance, not our job, not our savings account, not our retirement account, not our endowments, not our special funds. None of these are our source. God is our source. And when we believe that foundation that gives us the ability to move from a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset, when we see that God and God alone is our source, we position ourselves for the blessings of God on our life and our church. Too often, and I'm in this category too, too often we determine the size of our God by the size of our needs instead of the need, the size of our needs by the size of our God. God is our source. God is our source. And then at the end of the day, who do we go to? Who do we, who do we turn to? The third principle of an abundance mindset sows seeds in the natural. See where we are so far. You see, abundant mindset begins in the heart where we see a need of someone else and, and we respond. It begins at a heart level. Then it moves to a head level where we understand that God and God alone is the source of all the goodness and, and resources that we have in our life. And then it moves, it transitions into the, new, the natural. There's a natural component to this. And if you get it this morning, I promise you it will change your life. I promise because giving and sowing seeds is a vital part of abundant mindset. Hear this. What I'm about to share is counterproductive. What I'm about to share with you right now, I will tell you, is counterintuitive to logical thinking. So if you're a logical thinker, hang on with me for a while. Because it's not logical. Look with me at Proverbs 11.24. The Proverbs chapter 11 verse 24 says, Some give freely, yet grow all the richer. Others withhold what is due and only suffer want. The Bible says people who give, abundant mindset, end up with more. And people who walk through life with a scarcity mindset, close fist, the end of the day, end up with nothing. In our logical mind, that's ridiculous. Ones that have more and hold on to it should have more at the end of the day. And those who give stuff away all the time should have less. 
That's logical how our minds work. It's mine. I have to keep it. I have to hang on to it. I have to keep it as tight as I, have, I can. That's how I get ahead. The Bible tells us, no, 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 no. It, it's the other way. Which is illogical to some of us. It says, when we live with abundant mindset in the spiritual and natural world, everything changes. God blesses those who sow seed generously. And we can, we can sit here this morning and we can ask God, why doesn't God give seed to the hungry? I mean, why doesn't God give seed to the poor? Why doesn't God give seed to the lonely? I mean, the Bible says, why doesn't God give the seeds to those that need it? Instead, it said God gives seeds to the sower. Is there tremendous need in our community? Yes. And what's God's plan for meeting those needs of those people? It's the sowers. Do you get this? When we serve a God that is looking to give more seeds to the sowers. And as we are generous of and sow those seeds, God finds us trustworthy and gives us more seeds. God wants and needs more abundant mindset people in this community. And the farmers out there that aren't harvesting crops do this this morning. I mean, you have all these seeds, right? And those bin things. I don't even know what they're called. <laughs> what bins? Bins, yeah, there we go. And they, and they know, they know the only way to preserve what's in those bins, the only way to multiply it, the only way to get more seed is to take them out of those bins and plant them. They can keep a bin of corn or rice or beans or where I come from, it's cotton. They can keep a bin of cotton. They can sell it off little by little by little. And they can live off the proceeds that they, that they have little by little by little as they sell it off. But that would only last a little while. Or they can take those seeds, they can plant it and raise abundance of crops and get more seeds in return. The only way to harvest to get a harvest from a seed is to sow it. Think about that. But here is where it takes faith. Here is where it takes faith. And listen up church. Because it takes faith for us to take the seed we already have before the harvest. And give it or sow it and sow that seed first. And this is the part we miss in our church and in our life. We don't give after the harvest. We give before the harvest. And that is the basic principle of a tithe. That's it. We give God first a tenth. And in our giving, it recognizes that God and God alone is our source and the gift maker. I struggled to, to find the right way to, to illustrate this. And this isn't the best way, but this is what I came up with after watching ESPN one night. Had a documentary on, it's called Sign on the Dotted Line. And it's kind of like this relationship I'm talking about between us and God is kind of like the professional athlete and his agent. You see, the agent negotiates the contract between the source, the team, and the athlete. The agent's only job, the agent's only job is to get as much blessing to the athlete as he can. And when the deal is done, when the contract is signed, the athlete is overjoyed and happy to give a percentage of the increase he just received to his agent because he realizes that without the agent being the catalyst in his life, nothing good would ever happen to him. That's a type. That's a type. Recognizing that God is our agent. God is our agent. He is the catalyst at working and bringing substance, bringing blessing. He's the catalyst that's working and bringing increases in our life. In our tithe, out of our abundance is paying our agent. It's saying, God, clearly the first tenth goes to you because you have blessed me and you 
were true in your blessings. And true blessings and victories come from you. Abundance mindset is a tithe on the front end, not on the back end. The true power of God as our source in our life comes from sowing seed before He supplies it. You plant seed before the harvest, not after. This is where our true faith is released. Every farmer here already knows that. Our fourth and last principle says if we were to remove this, this mask of greed, if we were to live an abundance mindset, we need to expect the miraculous. It means we can stand with confidence and have a confident expectation in our heart, which, if you're taking notes, is the biblical definition of hope. We can stand with hope, with confident expectation of a great harvest. I mean, how silly would it be for a farmer to plant seeds and never expect to get anything in return? Well, if God wanted me to have it, He would just place all this stuff in my barn. I mean, we laugh at that. We would laugh at that attitude, but in reality, every one of us does the same thing. And when we trust, we trust God as our source, and we sow seeds in abundance in true faith, we expect a harvest. I mean, how many of us, how many of us have, have been in dire needs and prayer and said, God, you've got to come through for me right now. Someone I love is hurting, or, or I have a financial situation, or something in my life. God, I need you to come through right now. I know you're going to come through. I know you're going to come through. I know you're going to come through. There's a common expectation in the miraculous. But there's a hitch. There's a hitch. Confident expecting a miraculous harvest in our life requires us to properly tend the soil. It's up to the farmer to make sure that the soil is right for the harvest. So let me ask you this. How's the soil in your life? I mean, knowing God and God alone is our source, but if God used your boss this morning or tomorrow morning and came to you and said, you know what, we're going to double your pay, what's your response? Is your, source, is your soil ready? What if, knowing that God is our source, what if tomorrow we received a check to our church for seven figures? Is our church soil ready? Would we sow the seed? Or would we hold on to it tightly? Is it possible that God is not doubling our blessings because our soil is not ready? Are we consuming and holding on to things instead of sowing? Because see, God, God is looking for sowers so He can pour more blessings through them to other people. And this is faith stuff here. It really is. And if you, if you paid attention earlier, and then I'll say it again as parents and grandparents, we love our children. And we want to bless them with stuff. We want them to have more things than we had growing up. It's just natural. And we love them. And, and we want them to have toys and, and video games and, and, and things like that. You name it. But if they continue to break it, if they do not treat it or use it in the way it was intended, or if they do not share it with their friends, we stop giving them more stuff. Don't we? I mean, if, if, if they're playing a game and we ask them to stop playing and, and join us for dinner, and they do not honor... They do not honor our request. We don't go out there and buy them more video games. Buy them more stuff. Every parent in a way says, I, when I can trust you more, I will bless you with more. Because you have proven yourself to be trustworthy with the gifts that I have given you. Isn't, isn't it possible that God does the same thing? I, I, I mean, seriously, what if, what, if, what if this is true? What if God knows we will sow the seeds He gives us? Then why wouldn't He give us more? I mean, I, I think as a church, as a follower of Jesus Christ, I think God has little interest 
of blessing those who only use things for themselves. I really do. I mean, but I believe that, that God gets, gets super crazy. I believe that God gets so excited with those who sow seeds and bless others with the things that, that He has given them. I believe God gets so excited for those who bring back honor to Him with, with their tithe. I think God gets crazy and blesses people because He trusts them and He knows that they will sow even more than the gifts He's given them. I get excited because this is how we release the true blessings of God on our lives and on our community. God knows our community has some big needs. And I believe God is looking for His children. I believe God is looking for His children to be faithful and not just hold on and consume things. I really do. And I understand. I understand that, that some of you this morning are questioning my motives. That's okay. That's okay. And, and saying that, that, that I believe, Pastor, young whippersnapper, I believe that, that we shouldn't give to get more. What I'm saying is we're not trying to manipulate God here. God is not like a big slot machine that we put some in and we, we pull the handle and, 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 and hope it comes out. What we're saying is God is our source. God is our source. And if we look at these principles in every aspect of our life, whether it's money, whether it's time, whether it's resources, no matter what it is, if we look at these principles, if we look at our life, shouldn't we expect something in return? I mean, seriously. I mean, I go to the gas station and I pump $100 worth of gas in my car and I expect to maybe get 350 miles out of that. I mean, I put, put food in my body and I expect I get energy in return. I go to the body shop and I lift weights at the gym and I expect my muscles to get bigger. But okay, there's some harvests that take longer than others. <laughs> and you know what? I, I give my time. I give my time. I give my attention. I give my love. I give my respect. I give my affirmation. I give my affection. I give everything I have to my wife, Kelly. And I expect, I expect that our relationship will grow and be stronger. It's the way we live our life. That's, that's the way we, we navigate everything. And these are simple, simple, simple principles of life. But it will not happen. It will not happen if we're not willing to take off the mask of greed. And live a life with an abundance mindset. Let us pray.